Welcome everybody to September's Quality Sewing and Vacuum So Fun Live. Today we have Donna and Charlotte, our beautiful educators that have made all these wonderful things that I am so excited for you to see today. Now, if you're new, uh, so Fun is a program that we visit all 10 of our stores and we do 30 uh, classes all in one month. Isn't that amazing? We reach over 900 members every month. We'd love for you to come in to our stores and see one live. There is fun, friends, and prizes. Who doesn't want that, right? So if you have a chance, if you're in the area, come in, see us live. But we're glad that you're here with us today with Donna and Charlotte because they are going to share with you all their tips and tricks and all the fun things that they have prepared for you. And don't forget to leave a comment down below and tell us where you're from. Just say hi uh, because you'll be entered into a, a prize drawing. We have two prizes that you can have today. With that, oh, I almost forgot. When you purchase anything on So Fun Live, the products are 20% off, but they're only going to be 25% or 20% off until October 5th. Sorry, I got my numbers mixed up there. Until October 5th. So you want to nab all your fun notions and things to do uh, your fun uh, projects. With that, I'm going to turn the time over to Charlotte. There's your microphone. I think Donna and goes first. Donna. Mm -hmm. Donna. Okay, I am Charlotte. I'm Donna. And we're going to start today with the garments. Um, we have a sewing workshop uh, top and pants. And let me tell you about the pant pattern. It's called a lantern pant. And it's kind of the cousin to the palazzo pant. It's very wide. And then it tapers down with this wedge at the bottom. And very comfortable. The elastic waist fit really well. It starts and stops here at this open dart or pleat and then continues around to the back. It was fast to make and I loved the way it fit around the waist, the hips, and in the rise. But this pant leg is just a tiny bit too big and so I started on trying to narrow that pant leg down. And you'll see the reason why it's so large is there's a seam in the front and another seam in the back. So there's really three pieces to this pant leg, front, side, and back. This is the next version that I tried to taper that leg a little bit. And it's slightly too big still. So finally, I came up with the idea of just taking that front seam and taping it to the side seam and just getting rid of that front seam altogether. Now you've got the traditional side seam and you can see those pleats a little bit better here in this darker color. I love the way this pant fits and now those legs are tapered to a more comfortable width for me. The top is an asymmetrical front uh, application with a pocket. And this is my muslin, uh, just you know, scraps or, or remnants of fabric I had around the house. I wanted to test out number one, the size. This is the extra large. And because Sewing Workshop has such a generous, uh, mature fit, this uh, is too big. And so I learned that the sizing on this can be dropped down to a large. It's also good practice because you've got this square inset sleeve. And it can be a little challenging. And if you'll see, I did not do a great job in that corner. But I had three other chances to try there and they get better as you go. So perfect pattern if you want to do some uh, color combination and make all those different panels a different color. Or you can go a little more sophisticated, all one color, and then just do this offset panel 
in what is called a faux quilted leather. So that's just a little vinyl that comes down this panel and then everything else goes together the same with those square inset sleeves. And then instead of a small banded collar, I put on this large knitted cowl. And then finally, to accentuate that seam again, I did a striped French terry and then turned one direction and then the other one sleeve dark, one sleeve striped. This one, I did add quite a few inches on the length so I could have that little side vent. Now along the same lines of garments, let's talk about our sassy little apron this month. Uh, there's two size ranges. The first one is called the Sassy Little Apron, and this would be considered the small. Great for a petite woman, um, maybe a young teenager that's just learning to sew. And this is Charlotte's, and she has completely lined her apron and tucked all those raw edges um, inside the lining. The ruffle is cut on the bias, so that you get that flirty little flounce at the bottom. Mine is just constructed with the facing that comes with the pattern instructions. And I have finished mine with a flat felled seam and then turned under all the raw edges. So she's taken care of her seams with the lining I've tucked mine under with flat felled and double fold seams, but this would be a perfect pattern to use your serger with. Now the pattern does have markings to put buttonholes on the strap, but Charlotte and I both um, made the buttons um, just decorative. And so instead of buttoning this as an adjustment, I use a double D ring to adjust my strap and Charlotte has sewn hers with the measurement that she um, will use. Now to get a little bit broader size range, we have the Sassy Plus apron, and it provides you with measure, uh, size measurements from medium to double XL. And so this would be considered uh, the medium size, it's a little bit wider in the body and it's definitely longer in the torso. And the only change I made to this was I drafted the pocket a little bit bigger so I could put my cell phone in there. Because you shouldn't be in the kitchen working without being able to talk on the phone. Um, here again, I've just done the facing on the back and done the flat felled seam to attach that ruffle. No raw edges showing. And that brings us then to the medium in what we're introducing this month as the splash fabric. And Charlotte has um, a long presentation to give you on all the beautiful things that this splash fabric can do. It's not your grandmother's oilcloth. It's a beautifully laminated cotton that works so well in this apron. Uh, I've done the, the red is all quilting cotton, but the splash is the vinylized fabric. Now I was worried about attaching the vinyl up here in this rounded button area and turning it inside out and trying to press it. So I just attached a bias piping across the armhole, the front, and then finished it on the other side. And the way I made sure that this was in perfect position against the raw edge of the ladybug fabric 
is I use the basting glue that we are bringing in this month. And I just glued this piping down, bias so it won't unravel, and it, it follows that curve beautifully. Let the, the glue dry, and then came along and knew that I would be able to stitch that perfectly in place because it was already stabilized with that basting glue. Again, here is the ruffle at the bottom. It's important that you cut that ruffle on the bias and the pattern does show you which direction to turn that on in relationship to your fabric. Otherwise, you won't get that little, that little flounce. And then the double D ring, so it's adjustable at the top and the, the buttons are just for decoration. Now, I'm gonna move on to a sewing demo and I wanna talk about this curve here, how challenging that curve can be when you're sewing two layers of fabric and you want that curve to be totally smooth. In the machine right now, let's pretend that this is the apron, the top of the apron going down underneath the arm. And many of you will remember probably from home ec class that on a concave seam, all that's necessary is to just stitch it at a reg regular stitch length and clip straight clips almost to that stitch line. And what that does is it stretches that fabric out and allows it to fit properly when you turn it inside out. But the big challenge is when you get up to the top when you work on the convex curve. And what I prefer is to draw in a line that I can follow with an open toe foot. And I have used um, a blue wash away marker to create that line. I've dropped my stitch length down to 1.5, which gives you a lot more strength. And it allows you to do a straighter, softer curve and I can see every place that that needle is going through my fabric. And I'm trying to keep it right on that blue line as smooth as possible. So you have to stop every once in a while and give your fabric just a slight little turn, but not too much. Now here's the secret to this, and I learned this many years ago from Lana, our, one of our North End educators. Typically we learned that we'd come in here and cut a wedge through both layers of fabric. And what happens is when you get really close to that stitch line with that cutout, it weakens the fibers and they don't lay as flat as you would like. So Lana taught me to come in here and cut my wedge, alternating the top layer and the bottom layer. So you're gonna turn this over, you're gonna peek underneath, there's no wedge cut there. So I'm gonna cut a wedge and then look for another place where there isn't one right here and again so you can see that the every other one uh, section of fabric that we're taking out which will relieve that bulk when you turn it inside out now at this point if you want to you can pink this 
but this is what it's going to look like every other wedge is the color below it and then when you turn it here's a good example this one's completely done all the way around the curve and when you turn it inside out with a good stiletto you're going to straighten out all of those little points you're going to hit it with your iron and you're going to have the smoothest curve at the top of your apron or any other garment. This method is good for the curve on a, the flap of a purse, or maybe you're doing curved uh, pillow corners. Uh, there's lots of places that this uh, cutting method will work for you. Now, as long as I have you here, let me tell you about a few of the notions that we're bringing in this month. We have this wonderful three-piece sew line um, marking set. The pink is a ballpoint pen, and Charlotte was the one who found this. I think it's amazing. It is. Instead of the felt tip marker that we've been using to do the face of our quilts or mark ruler work or mark garments, um, this one goes on so smooth and light and you can snug it right up to the, the edge of a ruler and get a perfectly straight line and then it just spritzes away with water. Now, typically, I would spray the whole front of my quilt, and then the batting gets wet, and it has to dry overnight, and it's just a mess. Yes, it, it can be a mess. So along with this, we've got the Styla Aqua Eraser, and all this is is a syringe with a hole in the top. You stick this in a glass of water, you pull the syringe tube back up and the reservoir fills with clean water. Now, if the pen is new, you're going to give this syringe a, a little push. That's going to fill the felt tip marker with water. The nib is what they call it. And you're just going to come along and erase that pen like it was never there. I think this is so clever. And the third piece that goes with this um, group is extra nibs. So if you are going to get really aggressive with using this on the face of your quilt, you could actually break this nib down and, and need a replacement. But I think that's just a wonderful set and no line. Um, the stash and store, you can, you can see this. It's full of notions. Some of them are Charlotte's, some of them are mine. Um, we, I had the smaller size, and when I got this, I took the small one into my uh, makeup table, and that's full of makeup brushes and implements and all kinds of things. It holds a lot of tools that you use every day, multiple times a day, and I had them all in a drawer and the drawer was opening and closing. I loaded it up with all of my tools. And the favorite part is these little silicone pedals also open up sideways so you can insert a ruler. Um, cleaning brushes. Uh, Charlotte's got some of her things in here. She's got a big pair of snips. That's a good idea. Uh, anyway, really handy. We've got them this month in purple and green. And then the sewing machine brushes are from Quilt in a Day. And I know Andrea said to show you this, but I don't know if I can get the needle plate off. There. These quilting brushes have a tiny little head on the top. And they will reach into all kinds of cracks and crevices in your machine and kind of glom on to lint. Now this being a brand new machine, it probably doesn't, but 
My favorite thing is to run that head right in there between the feed dogs because that can collect a lot of lint that you'll never see. You can see that's a little bit linty already. So you get a pack of 25. They are disposable. And other people have mentioned that they are handy for crafts, uh, maybe your nails, um, and all kinds of things that maybe a Q-tip is too big for. And then finally, talking about the blue pen, I did use the felt tip marker on a dress one time, and it had a pleat down the front, so I thought, well, I'll just be clever and use the wash away marker down the full length of the pleat, then I can fold it over and press it. Do not press the blue marker. It makes it permanent. But guess what removed the stain? The Amidex. I love the Amidex uh, stain remover. It took out the permanent blue. Um, it takes out anything that maybe doesn't come completely out in the wash. And somebody in the audience said that they actually use this on the residue that's left from a friction pen. So if you use a friction pen, you iron the color away, and you can still see that little, that little shadow of friction ink, the Amidex will take that out. So, okay, Charlotte, um, would you like to talk about the splash? Oh, the splash fabric, yes. Okay. Um, okay, Donna mentioned a little bit about the splash fabric. This is, you know, like she said, I one of the things that I just, just couldn't stand was my mom's um, oil cloth. And she put that on the tables, and I don't even like tablecloths today because of it. But the splash fabric comes from a Seattle mom and pop store. And it is wonderful fabric to work with. It comes in a yard, a cut yard, but it's for 58 inches wide so you are able to make a lot of things so we have one yard cuts for you and we let's see I forgot the name of this one because we had Monterey Monterey and Juanita and of course the the um, ladybugs and one of the things that I did learn um, I could press it it you know because they fold it up in these um, nice little packages for us I was a little hesitant about pressing it. So I pressed it on the wrong side first. The iron was just the, the normal press, you know, normal way. And when I turned it over to press it on the right side, I did put a, a pressing sheet down. You don't necessarily have to do that, but I kind of did it because I, I didn't want to make, make a mess. Now, I made two aprons with this fabric. I'm a hairdresser by by um, profession so i wore aprons for many many years and this is my apron pattern we didn't bring this in but this is an apron pattern that i've had for years and it has a pocket here and a pocket here well how did i put these pockets on without using pins i put washable wonder tape around each part of this pocket so that i could set it on that on the apron and then stitch around it I used a 9014 top stitch needle. I did not change my threads at all. I just used the regular um, sewing thread. And it sewed through. I did not have to use a Teflon foot with it. And I was a little concerned about how it was going to, you know, actually turn the ties. I made the ties just as normally as I would any other tie, and it turned perfectly. Um, on this particular one, these, these are decorative buttons and they're glued on. I love glue and I always have. And so these are just glued on. Um, when I worked though, I would put a, my uh, D-ring on this side because I couldn't have the D-ring or a tie in the back of my neck because I wore an apron for eight to 10 hours a day. The kid's apron is basically the same it's just so cute. Um, I lined mine and I did not line this and it still has a nice drape to it. Now, I didn't do anything special. I just turned this under a quarter, about an eighth of an inch and then turned it under again and it made a perfect, perfect hemline along there. And I just sewed the, I just sewed the straps on and a little tie. And I, I once again, I used the wonder tape around here for that. I, I thought, 
I thought bucket hats are absolutely adorable. And this pattern is a free pattern by uh, Superior Threads. I tried another one and it wasn't wonderful. And this is the large size and it does fit my head. So, you know, now somebody asked about waterproofing. I did not seal any of these seams, so it probably is not waterproof. I did line it just with a regular cotton. And then this is the adult small in the ladybug, which would fit a pretty, pretty good sized little toddler. And I used our grunge in the inside. These went up so easy and were so much fun. Our fearless leader over there, Andrea, she made this darling uh, running with scissors bag with our Juanita and another piece that we're going to bring in next month that you could see. And so she was able, she was so excited because she, she was able to um, quilt this. And quilting it was really fun. On the, the ones that I did, I brought, we brought this pattern in before. And you can probably still get it. It's, it's embroidery garden. And so I decided to make the small bag first. And I wanted to see, just like Andrea, how it would do when you quilted it. And I, it, I did this with embroidery thread. It worked fine, went right through. But I decided to line it also with the splash fabric so that you could wipe it out and put makeup in it, whatever you'd like. So that worked out so well that I made the next size. Did the same. I put all the same liner in it. And so it's washable. And this is a washable fabric. You can hand wash it or machine wash it and then just hang it dry. So you can clean it. <clears throat> Donna and I think, I think this was out of the same book. But we brought in a book that had these real cute wine um, carriers in them. Now, I did not drink the wine that's in here. But somebody said, oh, that's pretty good wine. Anyway, so this one has a zipper in it. And isn't that the cutest thing? It's way cute for, for a gift. This one, you can just take to your picnic and put it on your arm and you've got your wine with you. Okay. And then Reva did a snack bag on one of How Do I Do series. And so I took her her little pattern and I made it out of the splash fabric. And, also, and it was an 18 by 22 piece of fabric. And so it's all one piece. It's totally lined. You can put snacks in there and you're able to wash them away. I did put a snap on mine and these are cam snaps and they are wonderful. I have enough to last me forever. And do I have anything more in? in the, the aprons. Oh, your aprons. Oh, you showed the... I, yeah, I showed, I okay. think I showed the aprons. I think that's what I have to, to show you in the splash fabrics. And you know, they are wonderful. You want to get them while you can, and you'll enjoy them. I think I'm going to do it. The wonky. Oh, I am going to do this. Uh, this is our wonky, uh, wonky log cabin. And we have a special ruler by Creative Grid. Donna did this one. And this is actually the block. And I'm going to show you how we get that. When my husband saw, this is the first one I did. It's a, the pattern that we brought in is called a garden pattern and so I did use it in kind of garden colors and my husband saw it and he said how'd you make all those crooked lines and I said I didn't they were all straight lines and then the ruler does the magic Donna did straight line quilting in here she also took a space in between instead of butting these four pieces four um, blocks together she put a space in there straight line quilting she also used i call it flange binding she calls it her magic binding and that is putting two pieces of fabric together one larger and one smaller the larger piece is this little flange that is right here and you sew it to the back and you bring it to the front and you sew right down in between these two pieces of fabric and it's all done it's a great way to do it she made this one a little bit wider than she normally does. I, I put mine on my quilter and I just quilted both of them on my quilting machine. But let's walk over to the sewing machine and let's see about how I'm going to sew and cut this. So here is the garden table runner and that's the pattern. It's just a simple page you can put it in a notebook, easy, just four four blocks in it. And let's see, don't want that. Don't want that. This, is, this is our ruler. I have marked my ruler. And the reason that I marked it 
is that this is where the magic is. And when you're using this ruler, every time you use it, I marked it so that, so the blue are my first round cuts, my pink are my second round cuts, and the green are my third round cuts. Now, when you're cutting, this is round A and this is round B. Every time, and I'm gonna show you how to do that, every time you're gonna use this ruler, you have to make sure that you're reading round 1A right. And then you turn the ruler around so that you can read round two, I mean round one B right. If you're not if you're not able to read where you're cutting, then you're going to make a mistake. But I did the little arrow so that you'd see that this clever little ruler is going to make it just makes a wonderful wonderful block. So when you're doing a log cabin of any sort, you start out with two same size pieces of fabric. This is all, this top piece right here is going to be my light side. This is going to be my center. Anytime you're doing a log cabin ruler, I mean a rug, log cabin um, quilt, you are always going to sew clockwise. So my first seam is always going to be over here to the, to the right and then the next one everyone is going to go around clockwise. That way you will keep all of your logs the same. Somebody asked me why I was doing this. Is it, oh, what if I made my dark side first? It doesn't really matter. You know, I would, I've always done my light side first and my dark. But if you want to turn it around, you're going to get the same effect. Just dark is going to be first. I'm only going to use a quarter inch seam allowance on this. And so let's... Okay, so normally I'm going to press this little guy really, really good, but I can do it right now with my fingers and get it pressed. Now my next row is going to be my next color, which would be my dark, and I'm going to line that right up and make sure I'm doing this right. Oops, uh-oh. -uh. We'll pretend that that machine just did what it's supposed to do. This happens to have an open toe foot on it. Okay, let's get that. Okay, so we got one more to do, and I'll show you what it turns into. So you're just making this like you normally would make any log cabin quilt. It's just really simple. And let's get this going. Yeah. Doesn't need to be. Doesn't need to be. Not on this one. It's okay. Okay. So I have this block right here. Let me give it a real quick press. Um, this little iron, we're going to talk about that. So do I get to talk about this? Okay. Um, this iron is wonderful. You know, it does not automatically turn off unless you put your finger up here, which I do many, many times and turn it off. It goes up to um, four in the temperature. One of the things that I like to do is keep this right beside my sewing machine and put, put it on an iron, um, safe iron cat, you know, so I can lay it. If it falls over, it's not gonna burn anything. We have this little stand here, but I don't trust them. You wanna make sure you don't lay anything that's hot on top of this. This little iron, does. I love it for doing all your piecing. You can see when you're pressing your seams exactly where you're pressing them. And if you need to press them open, you can see exactly where you're pressing them. And I've asked many times, is the, does it get hot? It's an iron, it gets hot, just so you know. Um, let's turn that. Okay, so now I have this wonderful block that has my light side here and my dark side here, whatever colors you're going to use. And for this particular ruler, you're going to want to leave your 
always to the right corner, upper corner is going to be your light side. So let's turn this over. So I need to cut this to round one, one down. Oh, I need to do it. Okay, <laughs> round one. Let's see if I can get this. Yeah, I want to use this one right here. Okay, so I'm going to line it up and it's going to go wonky. Now, one of the things that I do when I hold my rulers, I don't just use my fingertips. You, you don't get enough pressure there. I put my whole palm down and I usually put my little finger on this side of my ruler. I will move it when I cut this. You know, it's, it worked real good. So I'm going to cut this side and I'm going to cut this side up here. So I have one side cut the way that I need to. Now I need to turn my ruler around to where it says 1B, to where it says 1B, and then, okay, turn around this way. So now when I line this up, okay, when I line this up, there's a white line. You can see where I have this blue arrow and blue arrow here. <clears throat> this is going to line up with the sides that I just cut. So now, hand down this way and there's my wonky square it comes out square <laughs> I'm, not sure. yeah, I'm sorry it comes out square is that good nope, nope down right there okay there there we go okay this comes down here anyway this is the, the way it is now I want to show you round two and how you cut this so I already cut, I already did a round two sewn. So now I need to cut it. So my round two, I gotta get this down, is right here in the pink and it says round two A. So I need to set that in the middle. Okay, there we go. Oops. Now, one of the things about creative grid rulers that is really cool is that they have a, they have this frosted area on them that makes a great that kind of sticks to the fabric. So it helps them to be not moving on you. OK, so round two to be or not to be. Uh, let's do this. OK, so line this up. Now, you'll notice that I think Carrie can get this that round one is in black, round two is in white. So you kind of know what you're doing. You know, you can see if you're lining it up right, if you're using the right uh, cut lines and where you're gonna mark your, you know, where, where you have to cut your fabric. Okay, so then we have the round two, two done. I wanna pick those up, I'm used to that. Um, now, round three, I'm just, this is the block. This is the only time when you put your last blocks around, this is the only time that you're not gonna cut with your light in the right corner. It's going to go to your bottom right. And the center, I need to be able to read, read the center square so it says, and it's frosted and it is round three. It just goes right here. And I've cut this a little bit smaller and you're going to just cut all this off here and here and you have a 10 inch beautiful block just like that so if you only want to do straight line qu quilting or anything you can just quilt right in, into each one of these um, lines here you don't have to do any fancy quilting but you'll have a nice 10 inch block and it goes real easy i did when i when I did them, I did chain piece because it's easier to do all four blocks at the same time and much easier. Okay, and now I think I'm going to do some, let's see what we got here. Uh, oh, so I just kind of talked to you a little bit about this iron. This is one of my favorite irons. The reason that it is, is that it has a head that you can move and you can adjust to what you want it to. Um, it does not automatically turn off. Like I say, I, I am used to always unplugging my irons because it's just safety. And I like to have mine right here beside my sewing machine. And I have my wool mat, pressing mat here so that I can, when I'm 
press, when I'm doing piecing, I can come over here and I can iron my um, pieces right away. And this is by Dritz. And it's a great iron to take, you know, it's kind of in between the tiny little iron and the little one that's about this big. And it's a great one to take to classes. And you can have it right beside your sewing machine and not have to wait for somebody to finish with their um, iron. Oh. Everybody knows that I love glue. And I always have. And so here is Quilter's Choice glue. And one of the things I like about this particular applicator is that it has a great applicator on it. And when I take off any cap, what I do is I get my Vaseline out and I take it and I put it around all of the threads so that I, when I put this back on, it's not going to get stuck and I'm not going to be tempted to use my teeth, which the dentist does not want us to do. Anyway, so one of the things that I, I use glue on and I'm going to, is that when I am making my binding, I have two different colors here so you can see. I am going to have all of my pieces all best pressed and now I'm going to um, have them, I, I guess this is a bad uh, thing to say right here because it's this is batik. But if you are doing this with regular cotton fabric, you are going to put your fabric wrong side up. So you're looking at the wrong side of your binding strip. And what I do is I take the right upper corner and I bring it right down here, 45, and I iron right across. The reason I like this little iron to do this is sometimes when I use my larger iron, I will push that corner a little bit and it gets wrinkled and it's not very fun. So now I have that all nice and, and put it exactly where I want it. Now I want to take, this is also going to be wrong side up and I want to put a tad of glue in this little corner right here. Okay. Now, I want to dry it immediately, and by doing this, I want to set this exactly, this other piece, right on top, right in line with this, and iron it. Okay, so now I have all these strips done. I could take them over to my sewing machine, and if I've done this right, I think I have too big of a piece here. Uh, let's do this right. Um, I'm going to be able to do a 45 on all of my binding strips without any problem whatsoever because I have this line. Let me, here. Now, sometimes when I go to the sewing machine, what I'd like to do is I like to put my needle down so that I know I'm right in that crease and then I will sew. Now, I didn't have to mark anything. I didn't have to do anything special. Huh. Huh. Okay, okay. So now, all I have to do is come back over here and I wanna cut that to a quarter of an inch. And if you have Creative Grid rulers, one of the things that Creative Grid rulers is on two sides, you'll have a frosted side that is a quarter inch here and a quarter inch here. On the other two sides, not particularly on this ruler, you're going to have a half inch and a half inch. So if you need a perfect half inch mark, you, you know that you can get that ruler and put it in. So I want to trim this now to a quarter of an inch so that I could open up that seam. This I'm going to throw away. And now I have this all put together and it's all on my perfect, you know, perfect mitered, I mean, yeah. I guess 45 corner. The other thing that I do with my glue is when I do my binding, I don't fold my binding in half and press it. I used to do that and I used to spend hours doing it. I don't do it anymore. I get them all sewn up and then I go to the sewing machine, I mean the sewing machine and I just fold them over. The reason for that is that when you sew this on and you have this nice crease here, when you fold this over, this side on the top is going to be smaller than the side on the inside. It has more fabric to go around. And by not pressing it, then when I bring it to this back side, I don't have to worry about my press, my, my pressing is in the right place because I'm going to press it where I want to. Now I put this on the wrong, the right side of my quilt 
And my goal is to bring this to the back and cover all of the stitching that I put my binding on. So I am going to take my glue. I learned years ago to sew with Margaret Islander and she doesn't use any pins in anything. And then I use glue. So I could glue this all the way along here. And the reason that I do not use pins in my binding and or clips is those they're all your pins are in between. And so you've got a pin here and a pin here, and maybe you have a clip here and a clip here. When you're wrangling a big quilt, that binding moves, and you want it to stay where it's going to cover that sewing line. And you're going to bring this over, make sure it's done. I can do all my corners, and then I'm just going to iron it and dry. What ironing does is it just dries the glue. Somebody asked me about the glue sticking to your needle. No, it doesn't because now you've dried it. So now this is my front side of my quilt and I can take monofilament thread and I can sew right along in there. And I know that I've caught every single thing on the back. Donna loves to do handwork. I don't. So I do everything I can with the sewing machine. I buy them for, for use for that. So now my next fun thing is with this electric um, theme ripper. This is by uh, Nifty Notions, and it comes in a little box like this, and it has this little thing of, of foil. I am so glad to see that because I'm a hairdresser. I've used clippers all my, my career, and you have, to, you have to oil these teeth here. If you do not, you will lose the teeth, and you, you'll ruin your, your clipper. It's metal that goes back and forth. Now, how many of you have made an embroidery that is you made a mess out of it and you need to take it out. Turn your embroidery to the back side and turn on your clippers and start cutting all the threads. Just cut them back. Oh, it goes across this way. Put this on my hand. It's not going to cut my hand. Okay, so you get all those threads back on the back side of your embroidery, all cut, all loose. Turn it over and you know with those flat tweezers that we sell you guys, you can go in the front and just pull out all that thread and now you can go and re redo your embroidery. But my funnest thing is I'm sure that you guys are, as much as I do that you um you I've got to turn off the fix. How do I do? Oh okay if you have a fix stitch this you have to use your uh you're gonna oh this is she's got this at one and a half. Let's do this. 2.5 there we go okay Okay, so we got this seam here, and I am not going to put a fixed stitch on it because now I made this seam and it's wrong. When I did one of the products the projects up here, I ripped out all of the um, sashing because I didn't like it, and I took it all out with this. I'm going to take this little guy here, and you will have to use this end it just cut you know if you've used a fixed stitch on an end and you have a fixed stitch here you're going to have to use one of your seam rippers to do that but if you haven't all this is going to do is you're going to take it here and just going to see how quickly that will go away and all you have to do is that's that's on the fixed stitch and all you have to do is come back and take out all your threads and you've got that seam all the way ripped out and ready to do it again. My husband said, are you going to rip that all out? And it's like, yeah, you know, it was real easy. And then my favorite thing here, another one, is these spool wraps. Um, if I don't, I keep all my threads in a drawer and if I'm not good, and I don't get all those threads inside that drawer, I have a Roomba and the Roomba will eat a whole spool of thread. And so I am very, very cautious now about using these spool wraps. There are several threads that do not, you know, are you kind of unable to get the thread in where it's supposed to go. This will open up about this, you know, it's kind of like, like a snail and it goes right around this spool of thread and keeps all those tails in. I am very cautious now. My husband was gracious enough to uh, undo all of the thread that was caught up in the vacuum cleaner. And so I'm very cautious about putting all my threads away and having them all wrapped up. So you need more than one of these so that you can use them. I also make sure that when I put my bobbins in one of those bobbin cases that I don't have a lot of threads on that either so that they don't get picked up. 
And now we're going to go to Donna, and she's going to talk about our applique for this month. I didn't have these handy, but I do want to backtrack just a little bit so you can recognize what these patterns look like. This is the Picasso pant and top. And you will find these on the website on our list of products this month. Here are the two aprons, the sassy little, <laughs> the sassy little apron <laughs> and the sassy plus. And then Charlotte just showed you that garden table runner that's accompanied with the ruler, but this is what the pattern looks like. It's from Cut Loose, and it's one single page that gives you all the directions to put that beautiful runner together. So our applique this month is from Patchabilities, and it is these great little snowman balancing on top of uh, one another's heads comes in two sizes. You can make it in quilting cotton or you can choose wool um, applique, the wool applique method, which is a little bit smaller pattern. Now I can always depend on Charlotte to make it the, the size that the pattern calls for. So this is the way he turns out. Isn't he cute? Charlotte, did you turn this cane on the bias? No, my fabric was like that. Okay, so great. Uh, always pick up bias striped fabric if you can. Um, my let it snow doesn't show. That's okay. Because you, I did it three times and it still didn't show. You're just going to go in with a silver marking pen I and highlight I would it. I do some puffy paint on it. <laughs> there you go. Um, this kit comes with the carrot noses, two carrot noses, and a half a dozen black buttons. Now, mine, uh, I consider bigger better, and so <laughs> I have taken the pattern and increased it by 30%. And the, and the way you do that is just put it on your printer and print the, the shapes as large as you'd like to have them. So there's the comparison. Now, we brought in an extra package of tiny black buttons, so you can make multiples of these. And here is the hanger that you can see on mine. This is the 8-inch frosty metal hanger. And Charlotte's done a really clever way of applying hers. Glue, glue. glue on... <laughs> sticky Velcro, and because you want it to hold really well, and then just press it down. You, and have, it, you have to use extra glue or it will not stay. Like E6000? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the features of this, besides the, the little accessories, you've got the cane and his little uh, twig hands, and Charlotte has created a different landscape in the front. And then you just build your snowman, and I'm assuming you used fusible. Yes, I did, and I also used glue for all of the, the nose and the, and the buttons. Okay, <laughs> that, we use gl that glue on everything. Yeah, I, I'm a glue girl. Um, it was my first experience, and I am really sold on the glue now. <laughs> so, this is um, Charlotte's example. The changes that I made on the bigger one I made my own noses out of uh, popsicle, popsicle sticks just because the scale of this guy was larger. And you can see his little twig hands are from the maple tree out in my yard. Painted. I did turn the, <laughs> the cane on the diagonal from this fabric yeah. to create that, that wrapped candy cane look. Uh, I found some larger buttons and these two little bells that go on the top. And you know, the pattern is just a suggestion. You know, you can, you can decorate this any way you want. Now, my Let It Snow font is actually a real big blow up of the wool Let It Snow, right, right. the design for the wool applique Let It Snow. So you've got two choices there. 
Now my um, applique, well, let me, let me show you this really. Yes. Question. Um, what kind of glue for the snowman? And is it permanent? I did use permanent for mine. I did not use a, I did not use basting glue. It's permanent. Glue. Yes, I did. Kind of well, you can use either E6000 or any fabric glue that is permanent. On the hanger? Is that no, what? No, on the, the, on snowman. the snowman. Oh, yeah. On the buttons. It's oh. all, it has to be permanent because I don't want anything falling off. Right. Yeah. And I did cut all of mine out on the scan and cut. Mine I cut out by hand. And this fabric turned out to be very ravelly. So I took this beautiful little slender tip applicator and just went around all of the edges of that fabric, just the slightest little sticky to tame those threads, let them dry, and then it's actually just a blanket stitch over that edge because um, you're, you're never going to wash this. Mm -mm, so <clears throat> just because it's basting glue, it's not going to come off. Um, so I, I can't say enough about this. I, I thank you for this idea. <laughs> um, I just found a few more larger buttons and then used all of those little mini ones in the package. Now, like Charlotte said, she did the fusible on her applique pieces and you build your snowman according to the directions and once you get all the pieces where you want them, then you press them down and it activates the um, the fusible. In my case, I decided to try something different. I wanted to take my pieces and use spray adhesive. So this is our spray tent from Dime. And it comes in this little nylon bag. And when you release the wires, you get this great little tent uh, for, for uh, spray. So you have no overspray on your furniture. Uh, you don't spray something that you didn't intend to, like the cat or um, just whatever is close by. Uh, I put a piece of newspaper back in here, kept a little bit of the stickiness off the nylon, um, and then you can just pull your pieces out and it keeps the spray from circulating in the room. It can be washed. That can be washed. I just wash it out if with it gets sticky. Just just warm water. Get all this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And somebody asked me if they could use that for their cat. And I said uh, probably not, because the cat has paw claws. <laughs> well, I heard that rumor. I thought it was quite clever. Yeah, she did. I was seriously. She asked. <laughs> <laughs> just don't spray it heavily and then let the cat, cat go inside. In. Yeah. Um, I mean, was like mm. part of the instructions tell you that uh, unless you're used to folding these things up into a crazy eight. I like a it. like a windshield cover all you need to do is just fold it up and clip it with a binder clip and hang it somewhere um, and i thought this was super clever because all of my pieces now were built with the 505 spray and placed down until i got the blanket stitch done and that's the applique okay Oh, Charlotte, you're oh, going gonna... to do the, oh yeah. Okay. So I'm going to let it chill and I don't think we have. There's to... one. Yeah. Do we There's... have one? Okay. This is our let it chill by fabric, uh, come confetti, just chilling, I should say. Uh, Bruce Allen designs by fabric confetti. Did you get that good? Okay. So this, this is a embroidery design. And so when you're going to print this off, you can see that there's two different, um, Two different ways to make a wall hanging and Donna made the one on the right. I kind of made the one on the uh, the left. Now, I the one of the things that when when things are printed off and when you print them off, one of the things it says is says, please read before you begin. And that's always a really good idea, because if I put this in my uh, scan and cut, but even if you're not putting it in your scan and cut, you have to have the correct size because this is an embroidery design and your embroidery design is going to have to, it, you know, your applique has to fit inside that little circle that you're going to make so that the stitches go over it. So you have to make sure that it's going to print out to be one inch square. 
and you will like it if it prints out right exactly that so i did um i do put fusible web on behind all of my appliques so there's fusible web behind all of this and one of the things that i learned years ago is by nancy zeman is she had you make a hot a hot pad and this hot pad goes between the bed of your machine and your uh, embroidery arm so you could slip it underneath there and you can iron right on top without pulling your um, hoop off. However, you must remember to pull the, pull the um, hot pad out or you sew it to your embroidery. I've done that. Okay, so this one at the very top, Donna did, and she has a wooden rod. She's made three hangers on that. She can put that outside, you know, use it as one of the outside flags. But what she did on that one, this is our pillow size. And she took the back, the backing, and she brought it to the front, and she mitered the corners, and that way she didn't have to add any extra binding to that. This particular one I did, this is what I pulled out. I pulled out every one of these, and I put in a new one because I didn't like the size. <laughs> and it was easier, to me, it was easier to pull out all that than to go and make five more embroideries, and I already had them done. Now, Donna did this one, and she just, she just turned hers inside out. So she has no binding on this at all. And she also made her sashing white, wider also. And this design right here is in, the, is in the designs and they use that in the border. But because I had this print, I didn't need to. So Donna did use some of those right down here. Um, also what I did on mine, this is the large size and you'll see tie, the quilting is done prior to uh, putting your applique down and it's all little mittens and I thought the next time I do it it'd be really cute to um, do them in red and on my pillow here it's the same size as that one up there I fused 987 to the front and to the back of my fabric here I did put an invisible zipper at the bottom and I just think he's the cutest little thing ever and how I do my embroideries I forgot to one thing where's my little guy oh I forgot him okay let me get it uh, this I thought I had him right here sorry this is the small size so this is the littlest this is a little size and both Donna's and mine are in the, the large size so if you don't have a sewing machine that's big enough we'll sell you one but if you don't you can always do a small one and how I do my embroideries is that I have pressed I have pressed best press to the back side of this fabric and I've pressed it on the right side. Then I put either SF101 Fusible, which is a Pellon product, or a Pellon product 911 Fusible Interfacing. That is going to stabilize your fabric. Now you need to stabilize your stitches. That's when you use your, I happen to use a Floriani product, which is heat and stay fusible. So all of my interfacing and my fusible are fused to this block so that I come out with a nice, nice, even stitching line with that. And so what I did, did was also my towel. Now, this towel instruction is on our, our website and it's under how do I do my decorative towels? You guys have been asking me to do this for a long time. So how I did that, those instructions are on there. You can go on YouTube or on the Facebook page. But I took the, I did one of Donna's tricks here. I did reduce him. I didn't make him bigger, but I reduced him about 20, 18% really, because I wasn't sure how big I wanted to do that. But um, all the instructions for doing the towel are on our website. And what are we doing next, Donna? Um, we are moving along to the book. Oh, so, okay. Here is the book that we're featuring this month. It's a, uh, Annie's quilting book with nine beautiful uh, pieced flower designs. And it's just a wonderful um, representation of spring to fall, tulips to sunflowers. And the, the quilts are really easy and a lot of fun. This is my table runner called In Bloom. And it is shown in the book as a three panel, three block 
table runner. I made the mistake of cutting one of my, my fabrics out one too many times, so I just went ahead and make, made it four blocks. Now the blocks are 12 inches. Um, that's a nice big block. When you get four of them done, then it's just putting the quilt together. This was a border that I picked up here at the Tuck Willis store um, called Earthbound. And then just batiks that I had on hand that I felt worked really well together and some green uh, batik for the leaves. Lots of half square triangles. Once you get done with these patterns, you'll be an expert at that. I liked the combination so well that I moved on to Dutch Golden Age. This is actually the, the design that I was really struck with when I thumbed through the book. It's an eight inch block, whether it's the bloom or the leaves. Again, it's batiks that I had on hand and I had so much fun picking out the colors that kind of reminded me of the, of the tulips that grew in my mom's garden. Um, I know she had one that was like almost black. So I went from the orange to pink to rose shades and then into that deep burgundy. Um, lots, again, lots of half square triangles. That's what gives you this little ruffle across the top and makes the leaves. The leaf half square triangle is big enough that it can be stitched again and used in another place. So I gave it a home on the back of the quilt. <laughs> and I really enjoy doing these improvisational uh, backs, um, just kind of make it up as I go. So the one thing different about this quilt is it doesn't have warm and natural. I picked up the Pellon cotton batting. And I've had a lot of positive comments about how much more the quilt sh the quilting shows. It seems to be a little loftier than some of the other ones that I've done. So it's all, it's all just an experiment with the products that are available to us. Mm -hmm. um, so it was done by my long armor. Uh, and those are my two quilts from the book. Yeah. Charlotte? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this one first. I think it was called the, um, I learned, this is something that I learned the hard way with this fabric. This, this fabric was actually purchased for a different quilt. This is called frame flowers. And I'll tell you about the flowers, I mean about the fabric first. I purchased this fabric for a so fun book that we were bringing in. And I took it home, I got it all washed, and part of this quilt was going to be applique. I fused all my fabric, I cut a whole bunch of fabrics, and then when we started putting it together, or I did, um, things weren't going right. And so we decided not to bring in the book. And so then I've, I've kind of cut all this fabric now. And it's like, what do you do with it? And so it's been sitting in my resource center for a long time. This particular, so now what I do is when I'm going to make a quilt, I am going to make the block, I'm going to make one block, I'm going to cut one block at a time. And then I have graft paper that I can, that I can uh, graft my block and I color it just like a little kid sitting there coloring and see if that's what I like. If I'm not, I just do something different, you know, put another color in there. That has saved me cutting a whole bunch of fabric that now I have cut that I have no use for. Because many times I put a block together and I didn't like it and I just needed to change the fabric somehow. So all of this fabric was in my resource center and all of the squares, everything on here, this is a 12 inch block. Every, I, it should have had three more blocks in it, but because of the fabric that I had available, this is, it turned out to be nine blocks. All of these, um, uh, this whole square, this whole block was was cut with the square and the square ruler that we brought in in May, and that's I. It, you just get perfect points. You get perfect everything. And I do use my long arm, so this has been quilted on my long arm. And then this one was kind of fun. This was the second one I made. I didn't care for the first one, and so <laughs> so now I'm going to make the second one, and it's kind of got an interesting story. And I know um, the inspiration for it was okay it's 
It's at the entrance of the Matilda Dodge Wilson's Flower Room at the historic Meadow Brook Hall in Rochester, Michigan. So it's actually made after a, you know, a stone. And so anyway, I thought it was really cute, but I, the first one I didn't care for. Now, the pattern did call for two and a half inch squares for the, um, the flower pot. You notice that there's no two and a half inch squares there. I had this ombre fabric and I thought it looked good as a, as a flower pot. As I was pressing this before I put it on my um, long arm, I saw a spot up here in this yellow and I went and got my Amadex and I tried to get it off before I realized that it was actually part of the fabric. I worked on it and I thought, oh no, you know, but anyway, it was part of my fabric. And I did put this on my long arm and quilted it. I love how it turned out. Everything that I did on this block, I used my square and a square ruler and made all these, tri all these half square triangles, everything on there. And that's what Donna and I have to show today. So yeah, we have our gifts that we, um, we've had our drawing and we have two gifts to give away. If we call your name, uh, private message us so that we can uh, decide how to get these to you either through um, the store that's closest to you um, unless you live in another state so <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get we'll, it to you then we'll we meet you it, halfway yeah, we'll, yeah, right <laughs> yeah we'll get it to you uh, the first prize is uh, indigo junction quick clothesline carryalls and it's going to robin Bathler. So Robin, get a hold of us, and we'll get this pattern to you. Oster, I think Oster. Yeah, I think so. Okay. okay, our second winner is Joyce Boaster, and this is a great, great tool. It's Atomiter Binding Template. We just talked to you just recently about that. I just need to chill that Donna did up here. This will make your perfect um, mitered corners, and it's a great tool. So be sure and contact us, Joyce Boaster. Thank you. And we want to thank you for joining us today. And go and enjoy the rain. <laughs> yeah, I'll be back in January. May. And, and you and I will be back in May. Yes, we but will. we'll all see you at some of our Christmas uh, get-togethers. Yes, so yes, thank you for joining us today. Yes, have a great day.